own and operate a blacksmith shop in Southern Norway, where we practice and we do uh, all kinds of different work here. I'm going to blaze through these first slides because they're, they're sort of the everyday stuff that we do. Uh, this is just a screenshot from our website. Uh, we do a lot of railings. This is very typical of Norway as far as railings are concerned. This type of railing has the name. It's called Sørlands Rekvæk, or literally translated into English means uh, Southlands Railing. Uh, you'll see these throughout Norway. We do a lot of those. We do a lot of hinges of various types, candle holders, electric lighting, various things to house and home, shelves, uh, things to hang your coats on. We do a lot of restoration work. Here you see a, a ship's bell on the left that needed some, some reparation and a, a fireplace uh, stove, uh, fireplace base plate, uh, which was quite large. It's about a meter 20 uh, in length and it's about 25 millimeters thick, broken into three pieces. We did a sympathetic repair to it. Uh, also being that it's Norway, uh, we do a lot of things related to heating. Upper left, you see a, a um, traditional baking oven door. Same on the right is a detail from another one. And then an air register, wood stove doors. That slide on the right was one that we restored. On the left of the picture on the right, and on the right is a new one that we've made uh, for two wood stoves that sit in the same room. On the left is a repair, or excuse me, not a repair, but one we made from new. Us making that sort of work lets us finance what we enjoy doing, which is, uh, is sculptural work. <clears throat> this piece is entitled The Bird in the Hand is worth two in the trenches. And it is two meters tall. And we, the idea with this piece, it was in a, in a traveling exhibition uh, in connection with the anniversary, 100 year anniversary of the First World War. Uh, that exhibition was called Transition and it was shown in Ypres in Belgium. And uh, so again, this piece is two meters tall and Scale plays a really important role in, in the work that, that I like to make. Uh, I, I want the pieces to be able to be interacted with on a sort of a human level. I want them to be in our space. I want them to be sort of depending in your face or, or really challenging you to get up close and personal with them and interact with them as you would interact with another person. Um, and because of that, proportion then becomes quite important. Uh, and sometimes that proportion is, a, is merely a function of functionality, actually. Uh, if you look at the toes on the feet uh, there on the picture on the left there, the span on the toes uh, from the front toe to the back toe is, is a meter. Uh, and mostly because this sculpture is so top heavy, it's about 120 kilos, most of that weight is up at the top. And I really did not wanna have it on a plate. I wanted it to be standing on our ground in our space so that you, like I said, interact with it <clears throat> as an individual and then can sort of form a relationship with it you know, as you walk around it and look at it. Proportionally as well, the hand I'm going to skip forward a slide and then come back. So it's based on a an actual photograph from the First World War to uh, First World War, where they used to use pigeons. This is, of course, before radio. They used pigeons to send messages, uh, and and so here's this really striking photograph of a person releasing a messenger pigeon out of a, a side hatch of one of these tanks. Uh, and it was just such a powerful image to me. I thought I need to make a, a, a piece based on this. And so the hand, I'll go back one, is about double actual, per, double life size uh, because I wanted to really draw focus to that 
uh, as well as other things uh, in the piece. But I really wanted that to sort of capture your eye and be something that you focus very clearly on. Uh, the, the piece is, is about the use of animals in the First World War. Uh, Nine million horses uh, were, were actually killed in the First World War, among other animals. Uh, but, but it was the, the use of animals in the First World War was so widespread that, okay, so they used messenger pigeons to send message, messages, but they also, they also trained hawks to kill messenger pigeons to keep the messages from getting to their intended recipients to send help. At the same time that was going on, that exhibition was going on, there was the Ypres 2016 event. I didn't include photographs of the entirety of the Ypres monument, but uh, if you go to ypresmonument.com, you can see pictures of the entire thing. <clears throat> but this, this panel was my contribution and we can start to talk a little bit more about proportion than this. I'm gonna skip forward so that you see the drawing and then some other stills of the piece as completed. You can see in that photo, the upper right, you can see some of the monument in the, in the background. There it is in situ on the left. This next picture is a bit graphic, but the piece is about the horrible, horrific image, but it, it's about the horrible facial injuries that were caused with the advent of the machine gun and the widespread use of trench warfare in the First World War. That led to these horrific facial injuries. Uh, and there were two sculptors, uh, Francis Derwent Wood and Anna Coleman Ladd, who began making masks to cover up the disfiguration for these soldiers after they come, came home and basically just hid themselves away. Uh, they were made out of copper. They were incredibly detailed. They were painted, matched exactly to the faces of the, the, uh, the victims, uh, the soldiers, and, and it allowed them to sort of reclaim their lives. And I thought it was just such a powerful history and I had to make a, a piece about that. But uh, proportionally, uh, or what I wanted to show, and I did it through proportions, the facial injuries, the masks covering the faces, I wanted the hands to really stand out as expressive elements. I wanted the bodies to, I wanted your eye to basically glaze over the bodies with the exception of the knees, because uh, knobby knees can be sort of expressive. Uh, but mainly I wanted to, to have the viewer sort of come face to face with these soldiers who, with their arms around each other, um, supporting one another, showing camaraderie, uh, and yet the faces are flat uh, to show the sort of one dimensional aspect that the powers that be have when they think about sending people off to war. Uh, they don't think of them as people. They think of them just as, as soldiers uh, who, who, can, who are just interchangeable. Uh, and I wanted this piece to reflect that they're absolutely not interchangeable. And, and, and there's, a, there's a, a serious importance uh, to human life and, and it needs to be protected. And I thought proportionally we could do that by making the arms really thin. The fingers I wanted to wrap around the posts. And that was, that was what started getting me interested in my wife and I, these sort of long proportions of limbs and things like that is, is, is this piece here. So then moving forward from that, Monica and I made a piece for the Colbermore Blacksmithing Festival in Germany entitled Ashes to Ashes, Iron to Rust, homage to Holbein. Again, it's a collaboration. And, and, and almost all of these, actually all of these pieces, uh, Monica is involved to some degree or another, whether it's actually forging things with me or we bounce ideas off of one another. Um, she is largely responsible for the titles as an art historian and a, and a writer. She's extremely good at that. Also a trained blacksmith. So anyway, we, we love making things that are hard to take pictures of. 
uh, as you can see in this piece, anything that's sort of long and thin and attenuated, uh, I find with my limited photographic abilities are extremely difficult to take photographs of. Um, so, but, but here uh, in the upper right, if you look at the hand, you, you see the very long fingers, you know, the figures laying down arms at its side. And we really wanted the, we wanted it to work out. So it didn't look like the arms were too long, but we really wanted these long expressive fingers. If you look at the painting that, that this figure is inspired by down here on the left, you see, I mean, the fingers are long. There's a, there's a focus on them. You've got the the color change in the paint. We wanted to, to draw focus to that, but if we made the arms proportioned to the hands as if a normal arm would look, then the arms, the hands would come, you know, halfway down to the calves. So we made a conscious decision to sort of shorten things up. We shortened the forearm mostly uh, more than we did the, the upper arm uh, to come up with, with what I feel is, 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 is right. If you look at the, might as well talk about this while we're here, but the, um, the right sort of rib and hip and everything, that's, it's split to pieces. That's because uh, we, we used wrought iron and we forged it purposely too cold and too hard at the same time, causing it to split and, and rift apart like that. So you see the fibers of it um because we wanted to represent the sort of decay happening uh, that's how we got that effect after holbein i was invited to spend a month at stanleby in sweden uh, university of jotoborg and be artist in residence and one of the things that they asked while i was there is would you like to teach a workshop for the bachelor students uh, and the master students, if they'd like to to join in, this uh, that resulted in this collaboration that you see here called Lignum Vitae. Again, going back to this long attenuated um, uh, form uh, without limbs. In, in this case, um, it represents the spirit of the forest. This is now uh, we installed it in the woods outside of the school along a walking path that's quite popular, so that people coming by would just happen upon it. We didn't announce that it was being put there. Uh, you know, there was no sort of fanfare. We just wanted people to come out and find it uh, while they were out for their walk and, and interact with it. Um, that, was, that was part of the whole sort of feeling that we wanted to get from this piece is that people just happen upon it and then are forced to to uh, come to terms with it in some way, shape or form, whether it's just walking by it or stopping and looking and investigating all of them and walking around it. Um, so that was, um, that was, that was that piece. One of the pieces I made at my time in Stenaby was this piece here called Air of the Revenant. Uh, as you see uh, in the picture on the lower right, it's, it's quite tall. I'm not all that tall. Uh, but it stands about 180 centimeters, forged from three pieces plus the base. Uh, again, here I was going for a sort of contemplative, slightly hypnotic feel. The, the, uh, the piece is made such that if you bump it slightly, it starts to wave back and forth ever so slightly because of the size that I forged the the uh, starting stock down to, and because of its height, it, it takes on this sort of kinetic effect if you're, if you're willing to sort of challenge it in that way. You know, again, that's, that's because of the thinness of the material. I started from 25 by 80 millimeter flat bar. And in this case, I could leave the arms be as long as I wanted them to be sort of in natural human scale and size, but thinner. It, to me, I'm going after, um, let's see, let me advance this slide. Here you can sort of see. I almost always use this technique. I, I call it sort of folding the material over. Uh, really, I'm not forging it properly. You know, I'm getting the material to, the edges to roll over um, because I want to give the, I want it to be somewhat ambiguous. I want it to be, uh, I want it to be sort of a combination of, of skin, of bone, 
of sinew. And I think that's a really good way of illustrating all of those things at the same time. Uh, again, thin arms to, to get your eye moving in different places. Uh, at the wrists, that's about 20 millimeter round. The fingers on this uh, character are about 250 millimeters long. Uh, so they're, you know, they get longer and longer. Uh, the more of these figures that I make, I tend to make them longer and even more attenuated uh, and thinner. Um, you know, at first I intended to cut them down and I just, and I, I really was sort of drawn by them. And I thought, well, the longer I make them, the more that I can actually get them to do, the more focus I can have on those parts. Uh, so I ended up leaving them. Uh, he's forge welded. Uh, the arms are forge welded on. To the body so uh, that but the head the neck and the body are are one piece working on holbein we realized after the fact that his head was awfully flat uh, and that came directly out of the epita figures i mean he he was in in many regards a, a direct descendant of those pieces but we looked at him after the fact that you know his head is it's much too flat and you see the same here with Lignum Vitae. In this piece, I really, I, my original intention, uh, my original thought was to actually get and make a fully volumetric head. So I forged out the 25 by eight as wide as I could. I put the facial features in the middle and I started bending it around. And I had the idea that I was gonna forge weld more pieces and fill out the entire head. <clears throat> but as I got the piece, the head sort of formed, I realized that I didn't actually have to do that and that I could just leave it uh, somewhat rounded and, and, and the eye fills in the rest. And I really actually, I like the fact, I don't have any photos of it here, but you know, the inside, looking at it from the back, you get a completely different perspective on it because you see the, the, the backside of all the, the, um, the pushing out of the facial, fe facial features. This piece here, and the rooks came upon him. This was the other piece that I made while I was out at Stanaby. Getting longer. The, thing, the hand on this piece were up to about 280 millimeters. For two, and again, part of this comes down to functionality. I mean, we've got three points of contact with the ground. I really wanted, it's, again, it's really important for me that they interact in our own world, that they're not on a plinth or anything like that. So we've got the three points of contact. Two of them are very small. He's on his tippy toes. Uh, and you've got that hand. Uh, and those fingers needed to have as much of a spread as they could. Uh, and then it starts to look pretty spidery. Uh, again, we're at 20 millimeters at the wrist. And the arms here are quite long, uh, as are the legs. I shortened the body up. Uh, and that's, you know, a little bit closer to normal human proportions if you if you take the head and neck into consideration but the arms are extremely long uh, this piece got really unwill unwieldy uh, he's also forge welded together uh, and he is probably two meters ten standing up before I bent him again 280 millimeters on the fingers uh, you can see the palms are quite short because they're to me, they're less expressive. I mean, they're just sort of the thing that keeps the fingers all together. It's the fingers that really you can you can do a lot of interesting things with. Uh, and there you see, you can see a little bit of the backside of the head there. Uh, from the inside, you can see, looking at it from that angle, it looks extremely short. But again, because they're so thin and you, you come around them, you get that real sense of foreshortening. And here you can start to see just how long it is. That's 150 kilo anvil. So it, it, he's it's pretty I had tall. To get his arms up and out of the way and folded so I could get him in the forge. And I welded it up myself. I didn't have anybody else accessible at the moment when I needed to weld it up. But so it took quite some doing. So if, if the, uh, if the figure is at uh, 12 o'clock and six o'clock, the forge is at about five o'clock. So it's off to my right and back a little bit. And I could get it up to welding temperature, pull it out of the forge, 
and get it over the anvil and get it welded up. But it was it was a lot of work. So you can see I've got a stand uh, behind the anvil, holding up the hands so it wouldn't roll. Uh, and I've got a stand there at the feet, keeping it in place. Again, folding basically everywhere, rolling the material over to get that sort of ambiguous look. This was the piece that I did for Blacksmiths Without Borders Forging Through Time event. This one is a little bit abnormal in the fact that this is a time-based. So, uh, you know, we had three hours to forge. And so that the entire arm and pendulum uh, was forged in three hours. So I didn't have as much time to, to forge everything down as I normally like to give myself. Uh, forge it from wrought iron because it's softer and I could do things a little bit quicker. Uh, you see some unusual folding at the bottom of the fingers, uh, especially if you look at that picture in the upper middle, because I just left the, the chiseling alone. I hot chisel all the fingers in as opposed to cutting them uh, with a grinder or a bandsaw or anything like that. I like to, to uh, manipulate the metal by forging as much as possible. So not quite as thin in the wrist, again, out of, out of time constraints. So back to practicality. This piece is entitled Morph Chair Revelation. This is, this is part, this is the first piece in a new series that I'm starting. Uh, starting to move away from the full figures. Uh, so we see a shift there. Um, here I'm thinking about um, our relation to furniture, and how we interact with it. I have uh, <laughs> pareidolia, which is you see faces in basically everything and, and uh, or many things. So things start, start to take on a personality for me. Um, so I'm looking at looking under and through the structure of the chair, um, looking at the structure of not necessarily just chairs, but, but other pieces of furniture, contrasting the dual natures of steel, its desire to become organic as we forge it. If we let it do the things that it wants to do by itself and not force our will upon it, uh, which I'm a huge fan of doing, and steel's ability to become extremely geometric. You know, think about the steel that we get as it comes off the rack. I mean, it's 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 perfectly square or it's rectangular or it's round. Um, so there's a, a a huge amount of things to explore there. Um, so I'm working on the second chair now, which is a companion piece to this one. Um, so they'll sit sort of in groupings, sort of chatting with one another. So I'm looking forward to getting that piece finished. But really to sort of sum up, I'm looking at scale. I'm looking at uh, proportion as a result of scale. And I'm looking at expression. Uh, and those those three things are sort of guiding elements through a lot of the work that I do. Um, I want a story, a narrative to unfold with the work, uh, not necessarily one that I dictate. Uh, I want it to be sort of open. I want the viewer to be able to interact with it uh, and to project upon it and get what they want or need out of the piece. Uh, I want to provide just enough information that the viewer can do that. I don't want to provide too much information, uh, but I, I really want the viewer to sort of run with looking at and interacting with the piece. This is life size so that you can sit in it uh, and fully interact with it. Uh, and I wasn't sure how comfortable it was going to be. And I wasn't sure how it was going to be, you know, using that arm as a, as a, an armrest. It's actually incredibly comfortable. Uh, and it feels really good to rest your hand on that hand. Um, it's really quite comforting, actually, uh, surprisingly enough. The one last thing I wanted to say is that we have a blacksmithing festival every year at the museum that we are located next to. We're located next to an ironworks museum. Uh, they produce iron from 1665 to 1959. And every year at the last weekend in June, there's a blacksmithing festival. Uh, so I'd like to encourage any and all of you to, uh, to come and be a part of it and 
have a good time. Yeah, people have said impressive pictures. And uh, there was also a comment from Paul Foss that it's uh, quite related to what is happening at the moment in Ukraine. This was with the, mm. what is it? Bird in the trench, uh, bird in the hand in the trenches yeah. sculpture. The pictures of the First World War. And yeah, lots of uh, comments how good your work is. <laughs> oh, uh, Mariano has posted a comment about normally we find that the proportion of the bodies is around 1.18 or the gold number, but it's great that you break this proportion to show your point, push you to see direct to the anomaly. If we can call like that, really great because our brain is trained to find what doesn't match. Congratulations. The first one is from Beth Holmberg. How do you work out the exaggerated proportions, drawing versus forging samples versus other methods? That's a really good question. Um, usually I have in my head how I want it to look and, and I'll very often make a drawing. Um, 95% of the time I'll make a drawing. And then I'll usually just grab a piece of material and say, yeah, I need about that much to make that happen. So it really happens pretty visually because using that fold over technique, it's really difficult to calculate out exactly how much material you need. Um, I, somebody can surely do it. But uh, for me, once you, once you get into that volume calculation with a fold, so it's not a solid mass exactly, it becomes really difficult. So I tend to do it mostly by eye. Uh, and hope for the best. And it usually works out. What I meant to say in my talk too, one of the things I meant to say is that I'm usually grabbing a piece of flat bar that's got about three to one proportions uh, to get a good roll. It can't be too thick. Otherwise you don't get a good roll. And if it's too thin, it becomes too unstable on the vertical. And you spend a lot of time trying to get it back to flat uh, so that you can then forge it down again. So I find three to one works pretty well, give or take. We have another question from Pete Hill. What's your choice to fire well the arms to the bodies, a visual decision about how it will look? Or is that just because of your enthusiasm for the forging process? Mostly has to do with the enthusiasm for the forging pro process, Pete. Um, you know, I just, I had a month to make whatever I wanted to make. And I thought, I don't want to spend that month welding. Uh, with uh, with a MIG or a TIG. I want to spend that month forging as much as I possibly can. So I wanted to try out a couple of new techniques. Uh, well, not new techniques, but different ways of forge welding the arms. <clears throat> Some of them I, I actually left the big clump and split, opened it up and put that around the body. And then I riveted it first uh, just to keep it in place without having to put a tack weld, which... Of course, it took more time than just, you know, tack welding it. But I thought, well, what the hell? I'll just do it. Yeah, socket style weld. Next question. Do you plan to work further on the furniture or more figures? Right now, I'm going on the, in the direction of furniture. I have, uh, let's see, I actually have quite a few drawings uh, of furniture um, that are planned. So I don't know if you guys can see these, but... Uh, this is the companion piece of the one that's finished. Uh, here's another one that's going to be holding its own seat. Uh, this will be a form of a stool or an ottoman. So yeah, it's uh, it's definitely moving in the in the furniture direction. Um, so and I, I may come back to the to the full figures, but right now I'm I'm really interested in the furniture. So that's the way I'm headed. Um, and there's come another question by Steve Rook. Did you find the chair heavy? Are they just exhibition pieces? They are heavy, uh, and you can sit in them. Well, there's going to be some that I have one in the works that is you could sit in it, but it's going to be really extremely uncomfortable. Uh, but I do see them as usable objects. Um, because I want them to be used. I want, I want that kind of interaction. 
I, I want people to be able to experience them for what they are as furniture so that we sort of question our relationship with furniture. Yes, there has yes. come another one from Pete Hill. Do you think the furniture will be sellable in, in Norway? Is this commission work you do or is this on this question from me now? <laughs> those, go into the same those, are not, those are, those are my, my personal projects. Um, I think they'll be sellable to the right buyers. Uh, it's certainly not going to be the sort of thing that every other person that comes into the shop is going to want to buy. Um, that's where the other stuff comes in. But, but I, do think, uh, I do think there's going to be a market for them. I hope so anyway. Uh, the one that's finished is headed to an exhibition in Germany uh, in it's, it was supposed to be in March actually, but it's been rescheduled for July. So, so we'll see how all that goes. It'll be the first trip out for it. Uh, from Zachary Aubin, thank you for the presentation. Have to leave. Um, I have a question while we are waiting for more questions. How do you normally, or, uh, or how do you choose if you split the fingers or cut the fingers, or how does that work? I mean, you spend quite some time working on the hands and the fingers especially. Yes. And uh, probably there is some kind of conscious decision which way you go. There is. Uh, I exclusively chisel them. Um, I, I'm, I'm a huge fan of hot chiseling. I, I love to chisel hot. Um, and I find that I have a better end result by chiseling them. <clears throat> uh, I, I've, I've taught those hands in classes. And I, I know that some people have a problem with getting stress fractures right at the, right at the joint where the cut ends. Yeah. And so they prefer to, to, to grind or cut them. I don't have any problem with that, but I find that I have a much better chance of keeping the fingers. If I chisel cut them personally, um, I have on occasion thought, well, maybe I'll save some time uh, by cutting with a grinder. Uh, but it, it's not been a success for me. So I always go with the chisel and I feel that it, it pushes the material in such a way to make it, a little bit more organic anyway, uh, which is always the effect that I'm going after. So it is very much a conscious decision. Again, from Pete Hill, a lot of furniture is really just for looking at it after all. I don't think there is a problem making your personal work. It is what drives your wise work forward. Great work and thanks for sharing it with us tonight. Um, and the next question by Steve Fruit. Do you make specific time to explore ideas? In theory, yes. Uh, it, in, in practice, it becomes difficult with trying to keep up with orders and production and everything else. Um, you know, we've tried numerous things. We've said, oh, you know, everybody that works in the shop is going to get one day a week uh, to explore whatever they want to explore. That didn't happen. And we thought, well, okay, we'll try one day a month. That didn't happen. Um, so Monica got to go to Center for Metal Arts on a stipend for six weeks uh, in 2019. And uh, after she came back, she said, you need to make it happen going to Stanaby since you've been asked. So why don't you take a month and go and do that so you can work on your own stuff. So, so I did that. Um, the thing that we have said that we we're going to do now in the next little bit is we're going to work from eight to four. Uh, any, we can go in early and work on our own stuff before four, instead of working on jobs. And after four, we can work on our own stuff instead of trying to get production and orders out. I've been having a hard time making that happen as well. So I just try and squeeze it in whenever possible, but I find it helps if I've applied for a show um, and I know that I need to get something done by a specific date, having that deadline uh, always helps to think, okay, no, I just need to make it happen. So, but ideally every day uh, before eight and after four, I would be working on, on these pieces. From Mariano, how can you mix the body proportion with the furniture and the proportions of the art, like the arm and the leg? How do you think is the best way to mix them? That's tough because with the furniture in order for it to be usable it has to it has to sort of fit 
with the body. So that's something I haven't quite reconciled with. Um, actually, upon further reflection, um, I have sort of found a way. Um, if we look at this drawing again, uh, you can see, mm -hmm. I need to look at it from this side, uh, the arms are going to come all the way down to the bottom and they're going to turn into square bar down here. But I think they'll go from octagonal uh, at this point and then turn around and do the folding technique and have that elbow notch here. Uh, no, the elbow notch will be there, excuse me. So I, I think that, you know, doing things like that, I think will help to find that balance. But but you're absolutely right, Mara. I mean, it is a it is a balancing act. And if it's going to be a usable piece of furniture, there has to be a way to sort of do things differently than I did on that first one, which obviously, you know, the shoulder connects in up at where a person's shoulder would be who's sitting in it. So that one sort of has to be a, a very specific length. There's a comment by Steve Rook, which is chilling is more expressive. Uh, maybe you could explain that comment. It, yeah, because, it's, a, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a typo. It should be chiseling. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Makes sense. I agree with Thank you, Steve. You. Um, yeah. I agree. Yeah, that's. I always like hot chiseling because it's uh, it, it's just more expressive. It sometimes it doesn't go quite how you want it, and mm -hmm. it ends up that you get, uh, I think, more an expression and the taper of the cut, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera. It's uh, it's a good process. I enjoy it. Likewise, but it isn't the far. It isn't the fastest way to do things. No, no, it isn't. On those long fingers, I speed it up by doing a lot of the chiseling on an air hammer. Uh, that helps quite a bit. Um, but still, no, not the fastest process. But I'm, I'm a huge fan of the happy accidents. I'm always watching what happens with every hit when I'm making these pieces and, and see, okay, do I want to chase the line that way? Do I want the line to come more up this way? There's an interesting bulge that's happening here. How can I make that into a feature? Always, I mean, I'm constantly assessing that as I'm working on these. Yeah, I'm a great believer in using, if you're using those forging skills, you have to do a certain amount to maintain a skill level to make it practical to use. It's just finding that balance in, with time and whatever job you're doing. But I think there, it's good to practice. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Uh, from Paul Foss, beautiful works of art. Thanks for your explanation. Pete Hill, Shona says a deadline is the only way to make these things happen. It's related still to the comment before, I think. Yeah. Um, yes. <laughs> yeah. said, uh, inspiration sometimes comes without asking. Ha ha. <laughs> and yes, electric tools make the art too cold, in my opinion. Cold in quotation marks. The chisel works great and is more organic and less sharp. I have to say, by the way, I am a huge fan of cutting with an angle grinder or whatever else makes things happen fast. <laughs> <laughs> Which is probably because, you know, my teacher told me the first thing we learned in school on the first day, my teacher said, every heat costs. Mm. So, and this has happened huge impact on the way I work like if I have big stock changes I just weld that like I, I pre-grind I cut and I weld them together to save time in forging mm. and um, yeah I don't totally agree that you get another level of or organicness or so to speak and it's good to do be able to do both but I'm a huge fan of just you know going quick <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, I'm absolutely not against it whatsoever. If, if you look at Birdie's feet, Birdie's feet are all forged out of 25 millimeter round. The toes are 25 millimeter round. And then the, the legs are forged down from 50 and where they all come together. That's all built up with MIG weld and then heat, you know, ground heated up and then hammered back in. And, uh, you know, I'm a, I'm very much a by it by whatever means necessary sort of person myself. 
whatever makes sense at the time for that particular piece. My, my problem, my problem is I love uh, I love medieval ironwork. I love how it's made. It just talks to me. So uh, <laughs> I found that inspiring you know, in the past, the way the connections and everything, you know, forge solutions to problems. But uh, it doesn't always fit in the modern world when you're trying to earn a few quid. <laughs> Fortunately, no, it doesn't always. Right, so I said a few. <laughs> right. It's nice when you do have customers that see that and appreciate that and are willing to pay you to do it. I think um, this makes the difference because if the customer can see your how you spend your time in your work, uh, you, you, you are spending too much money in something that nobody is going to pay. <laughs> So then it's the balance. Yes, but. <laughs> There's come another comment from John Dittmeyer. A Florida Smith used the vertical bent saw to hot saw steel. He sacrificed the saw teeth to do so. I just uh, followed the discussion and um, really appreciated it. And uh, as far as I can understand it, or as far as my experience is, that you have different kind of customers. Uh, on the one hand, you have people which are looking for that. They really want to buy that and they are um, paying or um, they have honor to the work you're earned in. And on the other hand, you have a different kind which are looking for something which looks neat, but uh, shouldn't cost a lot. And that's that's the way what what I'm that's my experience. Um, I'm just doing it more for hobby, but uh, just just a statement from my side. I find that to be true. Absolutely. Yeah, forged metal work is an underappreciated art. I would say very much underappreciated. We we do a lot of events where we um, bring product and sell, but one of the things that is a requirement for us is that we can actually go there and forge. Um, there are very few. We do. We do two events where we don't forge and, and that's fine for us, but the rest of them, we're always forging at them. And so many people come up and they see us working on something and they say, oh, well, how much does that cost? And we tell them, and they say, oh, that's expensive. Mm -hmm. Then they stand there and watch us make the entire thing. And then they say, oh, no, that's actually not so expensive. Can I buy that when you're done with it? Uh, which is really gratifying. And that's one of the reasons we do it so that people see what goes into the work um, that it's not, you know, cast into a mold, you know, that we're actually forging all this stuff by hand and, and we're making it ourselves. Um, and I, I think that goes a long way to convincing people um, to buy it rather than just metal work at a, on a table. Yeah, you've got to keep trying to educate the public. I don't think there's any doubt about that. No, nope. no, nope, there isn't. So, samples always, you know, samples help too. If you've got a customer that want, comes to you with custom work, of course, you know, make a sample. And, you know, I, I think you're always more likely to sell the job if you can actually put a physical piece of metal in the person's hand and say, well, this is the texture I was describing, or this is, this is how that particular forging would look. I'm sure you've experienced that too. Yeah, yeah, it's, it, it works well. I agree with this. Um, but the experience, what we do is when you have a live forging and you have people coming in to the blacksmith shop and the piece you are forging is taking too long, they don't have, they're splitting up um, the audience. The one are very interested and wants to see how what is happening and the longer you take and the more you explain that that's another point you have to, um, to pick up the people to take them somewhere and to explain not standing on a forge and don't say anything um, the more you, you have conversation and explain the more interesting you can earn and then the audience will split up the one who are really interested and they they are astonished about how how long a process can take and the other one said, oh, this is taking long. Uh, I didn't expect it this. Um, there's another uh, stop I have to look and then they leave. 
And this is the experience we have by life forging. Yeah, I always used to find, uh, if you're always demonstrating, I haven't done it for a long while now, if you say to the audience, I'm going to put an inch bar through an inch bar, I'm going to make a hole. And that used to work. People who used to stand and watch how you did that. I, so I work at a lot of museums where there's, you know, volunteers demonstrating and trying to make sure that the amateurs among us are honoring the work adequately by selling those trinkets at the museums for prices that reflect the skill and the effort so that we're keeping the professionals fed is to me an important thing, an important message that we need to keep going through the, the amateur blacksmith world is if we underprice our work, even if you're really happy to get that little bit for something you spent an hour on, you're sending the message that that time and skill is, is not worth very much. And we need to make sure that we're looking after that for the rest of you guys. <laughs> you certainly do. Yep, yep. Yeah, sometimes when I show blacksmith to people, I, I make something and I said, if it takes 10 hours, it's more expensive than if it takes half hour, because maybe I need 10, 10 years to learn how to make in half an hour. Right. And this is the difference when you show to the people, and I think it's very important to show to the people blacksmiths so they can learn the cost and the value of the work. So yeah. when you show how fast you can work or how tricky it is make a, a piece that maybe looks really easy and, and simple, but requires a great amount of technique. So I think this is the, the real price. And with art, it's great that you can show to the people in the moment and you create the art and you can explain how are you thinking in the moment so I think Benjamin is, is really great that you make uh, this kind of art in real time too, because people can understand how you think and they find a, another or an extra value to the work. Yep. 